Hi, you're watching Take Control, a feature where myself and others will appear at specific times to offer insight and details about the making of the film. So strap yourself in and enjoy. We wanted to start more or less where we left off. You know, seeing Brian and Dom the way that we know them, and that is they're car guys. They just love to race. And um, it's a bit of a setup, and then you realize what's really going on. This isn't just a mindless race. But Dom has always represented Mopar. He's always been domestic. Brian's always been more of the import guy, specifically the Skyline. We featured the 34 in Fast 2. And in Fast 5, we saw Brian in the R35. And it just wouldn't have been right to not bring this car to the movie once again. This is the first Skyline that's actually been available here in North America. The Skyline's been an iconic car. I know the fans have always been really excited about it, to bring it back again going neck and neck with the Challenger, which is just so representative of Dom with the flex and the muscle car. Um, we just had to do it. Senor O'Connor, Senor O'Connor, It's okay, you're just in time. Fast and Furious 6 is, in essence, the last film in the second trilogy that started with Fast and Furious not to be confused with The Fast and the Furious. Uh, Fast and Furious was released in 2009, and that was the first film that partnered uh, myself and Justin and regrouped and reamassed the whole cast. When you watch the film, you'll notice that the title says Furious 6 and not Fast and Furious 6, and that was by design from the very beginning. This chapter of the Fast franchise was always supposed to end with Fast Five and Furious Six. And when you see the tagline on the posters and the DVD covers saying all roads lead to this, that's truly why Fast and Furious Six exists. It's supposed to wrap the mythology and just kind of end this chapter and at the same time launch the franchise into a whole new direction. Special Agent Hobbs. Riley Hicks. This is what, 100 million buys? It wasn't that hard to find you, Toretto. I think any time you have a scene with both Vin and Dwayne, you know it's something that is gonna be memorable. Um, because I think with them, they both come with very iconic values. And it was important, I think, to set this film up where it's actually Hobbs that comes in to basically recruit Dom and his family. Essentially, Furious Six, is evolving not only the characters, but it's also taking this franchise into a new genre. And Hobbs is integral in coming in and, and bringing these characters and taking them to a new world. You see, he's gonna come voluntarily. As a matter of fact, he's gonna beg me. I very much like working with Dwayne Johnson. He plays Hobbs better than anyone could play Hobbs. And I think his Hobbs character is a real asset to the overall saga. A little anecdote, when Fast and Furious released in 2009 and broke records, the only person that called me from Hollywood was Dwayne Johnson to congratulate us on our success. Soon after that, someone on a social media site said to me that they would love to see Dwayne and I in a movie together. Initially, the role for Hobbs was envisioned for a Tommy Lee Jones type. And when Dwayne Johnson took control of the role, he made it his own and brought something unmistakably powerful that we've been able to explore as the films progress. I need your help, Dom. I need your team. Nice. Fast and Furious, Fast Five, and Furious Six exist in between Too Fast, Too Furious, and Tokyo Drift. Um, when I talked to Vin, way, all the way back when I was making Tokyo Drift, it was about creating this mythology, his relationship with Han, and this idea, theme of family, and all the connections. That was to basically, we were gonna explore that 
in four, five, and six. And it was all gonna lead and tie up to, you know, the first three films of the series. Tom? Thank God. The first time the team is brought together in Fast and Furious 6 is at a headquarters that has been provided by Hobbs. Our characters are expecting to receive money and payment for the job that they're being presented with. We quickly find out in the scene that this is about something much more deep and significant than just money. Get us to Letty, we'll get you Shaw, full pardons all the way around. These scenes with the whole cast are the most chaotic and probably the most stressful in the best of ways and the worst of ways. Um, because ultimately, you know, all these characters are such a big part of the franchise. Um, they, they come with a lot of history and, and legacy that they, you know, the actors care about very much. And I want to respect every character regardless if it's number one on the call sheet to number 30. That's something I take a lot of joy in doing, but at the same time it's exhausting, not only in making sure that everybody's ramped up creatively to the right place, because in this cast, you know, you have Vin, who's you know, a New York trained actor, to you know, Paul, who his process is very much more instinctual, to Tyrese, who has more of a music background. So I have to make sure that I take care of everybody and I can showcase them, because they're there the whole day, you know, when you see a scene like this, it might be two minutes, but it takes forever to shoot because of all the different eye lines and coverage, and they have to do it basically a hundred times. That's the deal. Take it or leave it. Guys, I got the rover. Okay, well, I got whatever the hell that thing is. The flip car is fantasy fulfillment. The flip car is a opportunity for us to push the realm of car racing or car action sequences to the next level. And we were very excited about introducing an original element in Fast and Furious 6 that you've never seen in any of the other Fast and Furious movies. When I was kind of developing the character of Shaw, I felt like, this is a guy that's not going to be driving normal cars. He's actually gonna be designing cars that is going to be for very specific purposes. And I like the idea of a car flipping another car. And I remember Dennis coming to me and he had, I think like a Mercedes SUV with a ramp that was on the roof that would come down. And I told him I liked the idea because it fits Shaw's character so well, but aesthetically it wasn't right. And I felt like when we were gonna go to Europe, it had to be much more efficient and I said, let's try to maybe use the F1 as inspiration. And he got it right away. Within three hours, he faxed me the, the new design. And that's basically what you see now in the movie. The thing I like about Dennis is he is the big cheese when it comes to all the cars that we bring into the movies. But he's also very hands-on because he's a fabricator. His background is off-road racing. So when I knew that Dennis was still on the job, I was like, all right, it's probably gonna be pretty cool. And obviously showing up, being that I'm such a car guy, I really wanna understand and, and see what was going on, the R&D and everything that went into this thing. So when you wanted to steer front steering input in, like you would with a normal car, you just turn the steering wheel. But when you wanted to activate the rear wheels to initiate the real radical maneuvers that this car did, because I mean, it literally just can go from side to side from the four-wheel steering. It's actually a separate toggle. I mean, you're always at your best as a driver if you've got two hands on the steering wheel. So now imagine initiating a drift and then with your second hand, literally trying to steer the rear wheels to direct the car at a more exacting angle. Quite frankly, I think it kicks ass. The preparation for this Fast and Furious film is different than anything I've ever really tagged before. And I thought it was gonna be cars, but instead the training that, that, that I'm getting is for a massive fight sequence between Gina Carano, who's freaking amazing by the way. She's so cool. She's a professional MMA fighter for those who don't know. It was about a month and a half of strenuous workout sessions. 
I feel like both Michelle and, and Gina knew the importance of this, and the challenge I posed to them and also the crew is that let's not just make this a good fight. Let's make this the the best fight in cinema history. Why not? You know, like we have the opportunity, and so everyone took that to heart. So on the day when we were on location, which happens to be basically five floors below the ground, and there was no elevator, the crew had to carry everything down. It wasn't a sound stage. I wanted it to be authentic. I wanted the actors to feel the location. And so once they got there, they were so pumped up. You know, I remember we, we would roll, start rolling around 7 a.m. And around 10 a.m., I had to pull the actors back and say, you got to just pace yourself a little bit because we still have a full day of work. And I actually had to convince Gina Carano to try to be a little tougher on me because, you know, I think, you know, with all of her training, she was fearful that she might snap a bone by mistake or something. And uh, the stunt doubles did, you know, amazing tumbles uh, for the sequence. They took some hard hits. And uh, me and Gina took some hard hits uh, just getting it done and trying to uh, make the best show for you. So I hope you guys enjoy. <laughs> The idea of the Don Letty race, it was to put Letty in a situation where she feels something familiar, but yet she can't remember anything. And at the same time, for Dom, it's about this dance that he does that ultimately proves enough for Letty to let her open herself up and to be able to let him in a little bit. It's such an important sequence. I'm proud because we were able to shoot all that in two days. Just like old times. It's gotten to the point now where, what haven't we done? But Justin thought, hey, you know, um, let's really up it. And then going international, we opened the doors to the big boys. Well, the big boys come with bigger and badder toys than we've ever played with before. And so Justin thought, let's, let's bring a damn tank. They were nice enough there in Tenerife and the Canary Islands to let us use a stretch of highway that it was a brand new highway, it hadn't been opened yet. <laughs> they probably shouldn't have let us use it. Ideally, I wanted the tank to basically be going down the street of London. And it, I had a whole sequence design where it came out of Piccadilly Circus and, you know, Dom and the crew was actually trying to take down the tank in the middle of London. Of course, we couldn't shoot it for real in Piccadilly. We were actually gonna build Piccadilly very much like uh, building Shibuya for Tokyo Drift. But ultimately, I decided to go with the highway because we had full control and everything was gonna be practical. And more of the money could be on screen rather than using the money to build the sets. So the 78 Mark I Ford Escort, I remember day one when we walked in, I was with Tyrese and Luda and everybody and they laughed at the car that I was given. And uh, Chris said, oh man, they did you wrong. And uh, I could see why you would say that. I mean, it doesn't maybe necessarily have the pop that the other cars have, but overseas, this car is really iconic. This car, it just crushed, it dominated the rally circuit for a long time. This is the late 60s, early 70s. And um, considering what we were doing action-wise in the movie, I felt that it was actually the most suited car. Now it's a four-cylinder, it's carbureted, it doesn't have a ton of power, but uh, it's so light, it doesn't need the power that the heavy domestic cars do. So, especially when it comes to jumping and pulling off all the heavy maneuvers, the car actually suited me just fine, and I love driving on the right-hand side. I love it. Now we got a big-ass plane to deal with. That ain't a plane. That's a planet. I always love doing everything practically because there's something that that is magical, you know, and visceral. And to have a real Antonov is basically impossible. So I felt like it was important to basically build parts of the plane. And it's funny because at the end of the day, if you really look at everything that we built, we built the wheels, the base of Antonov. We had a fuselage set. We had a pilot set. We actually had wing sets. Um, if you put it all together, we basically built an Antonov. Oh, 
everyone's fight sequences came together pretty tight. And the reason was is fight coordinator. Okay. He didn't come in posturing like a lot of fight guys do. And then every guy in his team was the same guy. I mean, they're just super mellow, came in, they were all about being professional. And it wasn't about their fight in the movie. It was about how they can make the movie better with their fight scene. And um, a lot of what we got that actually ended up working really, really well was actually a mistake. But the mistakes work so well because we knew the dance, just inside and out. We all got hit, we all got banged up, and uh, <laughs> nobody lost their shit, which <laughs> I've seen happen a bunch in the past, so it was a really good experience. Are we building the car? First car better be a Charger, Jack. Now, you're looking at a situation where these guys like who I were said, running on the wrong better. side of the tracks are all of a sudden given pardons. And they're allowed to come back home to the United States and live as law-abiding citizens of the United States of America. And when thinking about that and the responsibility that that holds, and then thinking about the lifestyle, something doesn't match. So I would find it really interesting to see, you know, where this goes. Would a Letty character want to stick around if she's not living the fast life? Would any of the characters want to stick around if they're not living the fast life? And I think that that's an interesting question. Thank you. Good luck. The first Fast and Furious was released in 2001. That was a film we shot in 1999, the last year of the last millennium. And there was a very important scene there where my character tells another character to pray. Scenes like that set us apart from what people's expectations were about an action movie. Our movie was backed with real heart. To be able to return to that set, that exact location that I was filming in 1999, in 2012, was surreal. You'll see at the end of the movie, how much of an homage we paid to the first film when we end the movie on a prayer. For all the choices we've made because that's what makes us who we are. Let us it's been a great ride to be a part of this franchise. Um, when I came on to do Tokyo Drift, I, I literally had just done basically a credit card movie right before it. And um, to be able to, to be handed over uh, the reins to the franchise and, and to try to do something to evolve it. Uh, I, I feel lucky to have Universal as a partner. But at the same time, to be able to make four movies, I give a lot of credit to the audience, to the fans, because, you know, sequels don't just happen. They, they are earned. You know, I, as I'm kind of ending this chapter, uh, I, I feel great because I, I feel like the franchise is in the best position it's ever been. You know, and um, I remember calling Jason Statham and, and asking him to come in and do the tag. And I feel good about that because, you know, not only is it in the best shape, I feel like I'm, I'm handing it off and I'm kind of excited to see how the next chapter is going to be told. Dominic Tourette up. You don't know me. You're about to.